Hi, I'm Daria Burke, Chief Marketing Officer at Just Fab, welcoming you back to Leading with Style. Today, I am here with entrepreneur, media maven, and small business advocate, Morgan Debon. You may know her as the co-founder and CEO of Blavity, and she has gone on to create a number of incredible new ventures that we'll talk a little bit more about. While we are here virtually for the first time in this series, Morgan from her very small and closed Just Fab set and me from home. I am no less thrilled and excited to be here for this conversation and for you to get a feel for her entrepreneurial spirit and a bit of style wisdom as well. Morgan, thank you so much for being here and for partnering with us. I am really, really excited and looking forward to our conversation today. You started Blavity, the leading media company for Black Millennials, six years ago, and that was really just the beginning for you. I'd love to start, though, by hearing about Blavity and how it came about. Well, I'm so excited to be with you here today. Um, Blavity was a dream in so many ways for me and my co-founders, Jeff and Aaron and Jonathan. We started the company um, for so many different reasons. You know, six years ago, I was in Silicon Valley working at a big tech company. You know how it is, it, uh, you know, working I in those do. tech companies. It can be a little lonely and, um, and also from a a business point of view, what we were looking at and what we were seeing was that the black community and our generation of black millennials didn't really have a media company that was speaking to our voice and speaking to our power and being a platform for stories, for narration, and for our creatives to be able to have a place to distribute their ideas and their thoughts. Um, at the time, six years ago, Mike Brown had also just happened, and I'm from St. Louis. So being from St. Louis and sitting in this big tech company, um, I felt really disconnected. I felt disconnected from my family, from my community, and I saw the impact that not having a diverse representation in media had on the story and the news and our access to information. And this information was so important for us to be able to figure out how to bail people out of jail, to figure out how to support who are we donating to, how do we help the, the movement move faster, and news and media is a core part of getting the information out to the people. So that's a little bit about why Blavity started six years ago. We've come a long way since then. Uh, one company, one brand, and now we have five brands in our portfolio, um, and we reach you know 70 million people a month. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible amount of people that we touch every day. It has been incredible, and you mentioned uh, about your some of your acquisitions, and you've gone on, you know, amongst them to acquire Travel Noir and Shadow and Act. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the companies that live under the Blavity umbrella and portfolio and why it was so important for you to continue to expand this platform and, and the ways in which you thought about doing that with the different verticals that you've been creating? So one of the things that's always frustrated me sometimes about like mainstream media is that black is viewed as a monolith that we're all the same, we have the same ideals, we listen to the same music, uh, we watch the same things, the same Christmas movies, and that's just not the case. You know, we are an incredibly diverse group of people in this country, ranging from first generation, second generation, many people on my team, you know, this is their first tech company that they've ever worked for, a media company they've ever worked for in their family. Um, the range of ideas and creativity in the black community is huge. And so one of the things when we think about Blavity and we were building out this organization in the company, I wanted to make sure that we had different brands that could reach the lifestyle of black people every single day. And not just news, not just the information that you need to know, but also where are you gonna travel? Where are you going to eat? If you want to buy black, how do you do that? If you want to build a business, what does that look like? How do you raise money? How do you break into the technology industry, which is the fastest way to grow wealth in this country? Um, how do you pitch a film for the first time? How do you pitch and get into award shows um, or film festivals? And so each one of our brands is tailored towards going deep with our audience and really building that trust so that they know that they can come back to us no matter what it is. Um, so Blavity News, you know, our flagship brand, Shadow and Act, which focuses on black Hollywood and, and film, um, 2190, which is health and wellness for black women, Travel Noir, 
which is travel and culture and Afrotech, which is black tech Amazing. and entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you know, quite a lot about that, which, you know, I think it brings such a different level of authenticity to the content that you create too. And, and I love, and we'll talk more about it, just how deeply connected you are, not just to sharing those stories or even having the platform of Afrotech and bringing people together, but, you know, bringing your experience to it and, and helping people understand what it looks like to be a founder and to write a business plan, to create, you know, create a vision for what you're trying to build. And, you know, this year, this past year in particular, you know, we saw so much change and potential for change in 2020 alongside so many challenges at the same time. How was it for you as a, a black founder and leader in 2020, leading your teams, leading your company and being a media platform on top of that with everything that we saw happening this past year? I feel like Blavity was really created to excel in this moment. Um, you know, I feel privileged and humbled that we were able to serve in the way that we were last year. My first priority as the founder and CEO of the company was to make sure my employees were taken care of. Um, we went remote very early in the process, um, essentially when Seattle started to shut down, which was, you know, the first city to really say, hey, there's a thing going on. Um, we shut down and I told my employees, I mean, it looked kind of like, really chaotic. I was like, get your laptops, get your monitors. You know, I was like, you're going to be home for a long time. They thought I was a little bit nuts um, and that I was overreacting, but I, I took it very seriously. And our leadership team, um, our directors at the company, we focused on health and mental stability of our employees first, because we knew that if we were going to make it through this and um, as a team and together that people needed to feel taken care of and they needed to know that as a organization that they were a priority. So everything from we did daily meditations um, in the morning run by our people operations team to self-care days to we did a self-care stipend, a treat yourself stipend is what I called it, just so that people knew and had the freedom to be able to take care of themselves. Because I believe for us to really serve um, and to do the work of covering the Black Lives Matter movement, covering death as a, a black news company is incredibly draining. Um, it's, it's really, really hard. And I was hyper conscious that, um, you know, you didn't know how long this was going to last. And so we wanted to, to do our best work and to do that, everybody needed to take care of themselves. Um, and funny. then, you know, I think as a founder, there's that fear of you spent, you've risked your whole life building something. And in a blink of an eye, it could be taken away because of a pandemic and, and situations out of your control. And so I had to do a lot of self-management to make sure that I could show up as a leader um, and help us navigate through whatever was coming our way. So I'm glad that we have made it through. The company grew. We had some of our best quarters um, last year than in the company's history. So I'm very proud of the work we were able to accomplish together. Congratulations. And I love that idea of self-management. I think a lot about self-leadership and I'm curious, what, what does that look like for you? What does that look like for you during this time? And how has it changed or evolved your own sort of self-leadership? So much self-work, you know, I think being a CEO, being a founder is one of the most challenging things you could ever do. You know, building a company from scratch. Um, I have really focused on gratitude and being grateful. And so I uh, practice gratitude every day and I write out every night, you know, the things that I'm grateful for. I start my morning with uh, meditation in the Headspace app or prayer. And um, so I, centering myself and being focused on doing my best every single day is how I've been able to keep myself grounded and not um, just constantly thinking about all the different scenarios that can happen, especially in chaos. I think that's right. And I, I am nodding so much too, because I can relate. And I think we have a lot of the same practices and rituals. Mm -hmm. And I feel fortunate that I had built that into my 
ecosystem and, and sort of in the routine before all of this happened. But I think there has been such an incredible test of will, of strength, of um, just of fortitude and, and resilience on a different level that we ever thought we would ever have to demonstrate. And then to be able to show up for your teams and ensure physical and psychological safety for them at the same time. Right. So I love that. And I think having a spiritual practice, whatever it is, um, I think is, is really important in keeping us grounded. And I'm sure your team feels incredibly grateful and you know having the ability to have that you know, available to them as well. And you bringing that into the culture, I think is, is really important. And congratulations on being able to do that and be able to be successful and have such an amazing 2020 as a business at the same time. So bravo Thank to you. you and to your leadership you. team. Something magical that can happen when you create a business from the ground up. I think it, you know, you've been able to see now multiple businesses really transform before your eyes. So I'm curious, you know, what is one way that you've seen Blavity evolve that you couldn't have possibly dreamed of? <laughs> you know, I always wanted us to be big and have a huge impact. I'm not sure that I knew the multitude of industries that we would impact. You know, I, I was committed to media, news, diverse representation, you know, a pipeline of reporters that we were going to be the first place for young journalists of color to work. And I was very in alignment with that mission. But the impact that we're now making in the travel industry, we, we work with countries, we work with tourism boards to increase travel around the world for black millennials. We, you know, right now Tulum is having a moment, right? So we've done a lot of work to make sure that people know where to go, how to navigate um, different places. I never thought that even in Hollywood and entertainment, you know, Shadow and Act, which was one of our acquisitions, has been around for quite some time and was the first place to cover some of the most amazing filmmakers of our generation. And now a lot of filmmakers or actors or actresses are building their own production companies and they're becoming the owners of their own assets. So to be able to be a core part of celebrating the work of the best leaders of our generation is incredibly humbling and I take it very seriously. Our team um, is full of ideas and creativity. I think that's the other thing that personally that like makes me really stay motivated even when we're in tough times is my team. You know, every single day, you know, we have new people who are like, let's build this podcast. Let's try this idea. We should cover this story. And so it's the individuals that also keep me motivated. Absolutely. You mentioned Tulum being hot right now, which made me a little nervous. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious how how, you know, travel noir especially has been affected with the pandemic and, you know, so many people needing to shelter in place at home. How has mm -hmm. that sort of evolved the business at all for you? You know, I was really worried about travel noir, especially when it's an acquisition. You want to make sure that you're you're returning all of the investment on, the, on that deal. Um, travel noir's traffic has never been higher which is so interesting to me, you know, it tickles me every time. The reason why is because the black community and I think community at large, we are planning, we are lusting right now, we are aspiring for more. And so there's a lot of folks doing research on their getaway trip once that happens, once the vaccine makes it out um, to all of us. And so there's a lot of planning. The other thing we've seen, and we've increased our domestic travel, so road trips, so places that you can go where you can be safe um, and get out and explore America. I mean, the diversity of our country is beautiful. You know, more and more people went camping than, than ever before, people visiting national parks than ever before. Um, and that's, that's something that's really special, learning more about our own environment that's right outside. I love that. And I do, I think it's important. I mean, I moved to LA right before the pandemic. And so it's been nice to every now and again, get in the car and just drive around, even if I can't really do much when I get there. But I think it's it's really nice to be able to, to have that moment and for folks to be able to look to Travel Noir for those tips and that advice as well. So in honor of Black History Month, which is when this will air, and in honor of our partnership, You've selected four Black-owned businesses for Just Fab to Spotlight, which I'm excited about and, and very proud to be able to do. And we'll be purchasing gift cards and uh, conducting giveaways on Instagram from those businesses throughout the month. Please tell us just a little bit more about the businesses you selected and why, and yes. um, just share with the people what we should look forward to. Well, I, 
I thought this was special timing, you know? So a couple things. I wanted to um, help our community discover and help the Just Fab community discover businesses and products that would help them with their routine. So my morning routine is wake up and read. And so Shelves Bookstore is an amazing bookstore. It's a mobile bookstore as well as an, an e-commerce site where you can buy books from black authors. Um, it's so important that we support our local bookstores. What we saw in COVID was that people were reading more than ever. Um, and also that local businesses had some challenges, you know, and um, Shelves was one of those businesses that was able to pivot to e-commerce and grow their business. And so I'm really excited to support Abby's, the, the founder of that business, um, Shelves. And then the second thing in the morning is coffee. I mean, I have been on a coffee. I used to be a girl who, you know, grabbed the coffee on the way to work. But now coffee is a ritual for me. It's a moment for me to like slow down, enjoy a nice warm cup of coffee, um, sit there whether I'm doing my meditation or writing, and I have a moment to myself in the morning. So Red Bay Coffee is a black owned coffee shop um, and coffee brand in the Bay Area. I think they were suppliers for a lot of the um, tech companies in the Bay Area, so some people may be familiar with it. And their founder is also fantastic. So that's my morning routine. The other two products um, are for the evening. You know, a little kickback. We've had a long day. You got to transition into the cozy vibes. You know, I always switch into pajamas. That was one thing that I made sure that I did even in COVID was like, you have your work day, and then you switch into pajamas, you put the slippers on, you know, and you try to relax. So um, my two things have been a little glass of wine from the McBride sisters, and then sometimes a bath. So Lufa Cub is the other small business. I love that. And by the way, I love Black Girl Magic. Their red blend is so okay. good. And um, a, a friend of mine from Facebook, um, not a black woman, but she recently just posted about how much she loved their Zinfandel. So I love that Delicious. the McBride sisters are, are getting oh, getting that awareness and folks yes. are becoming aware, aware of their amazing wine because it is so and good. And their story so, is amazing. Um, thank you. Their story is very cool. They're, um, they were sisters who discovered themselves. They didn't know they were sisters. So if anyone's curious about an inspirational black girl magic story, definitely check them out. Morgan, you've been quoted as saying, don't wait for someone to tell you yes, which I really love. And I think that more young people need to hear that. How has this principle steered your life and your career? And how do you carry this mantra into everything that you do? You know, I came up with the, like, not waiting for permission um, for so many reasons because for me, I was really young when I started the company. I was 23. Um, I'm a young CEO. There's a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, but what I did know was that I wanted to make an impact and I wanted to build something that my community could be proud of. And if I had waited for someone to give me permission, I would still be waiting. You know, the data and the odds aren't necessarily always on our side as women of color. Um, you, we all know the data on fundraising and how challenging it can be for women. Um, and I think that it's important as entrepreneurs and as people who want to make a difference in others' lives that we do not wait for someone else to say it's okay. And we go ahead and we say, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is how you can help. And you live fully in, in your purpose every single day, and you try to do your best. And um, I think if we all just did that a little bit more, we'd be happier. I think you're right. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes says that people suffer when they live a life or pursue a dream that doesn't belong to them. And, you know, I think that is is so true. And I think with that is is that that exact idea of waiting for permission or not waiting for permission, really, mm -hmm. um, to go for what you want. Because I think that is where a lot of suffering tends to happen, where people find themselves sort of at odds with other people's expectations That's of right. them or how they should show up or or what they should do, what they should go after. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. And I just, I feel like you inspire so many women and you are, yes, you're a young CEO, but um, as an elder millennial, you know, I will say, I think that you are an incredibly inspiring leader. And so, you know, with that, what is your biggest advice for women who have C-suite ambitions? So for women who have C-suite ambitions, a couple of pieces of advice. Um, one, understand what the C-suite does. 
I find that there's a misunderstanding sometimes be around what it means to be a chief at a company, whether that's CFO, chief financial officer, CMO, chief marketing officer, um, CEO or COO, chief operating officer. And um, understanding what that person actually truly does, what their job is, is one of the first things that you have to do if you want to, if you aspire to get to that level. The second thing is understand that everybody's pathway is different. So what might have worked for someone 10 years ago to get at that sea level is gonna be completely different than what it takes for you to get there because the world changes, the market changes, trends change. Um, and so you have to understand what your unique value proposition is and your unique opportunity giving your strengths and what's happening around you and your timeline. So that's the second thing. Sometimes I see a lot of people, oh, this so-and-so became a CEO in this many years or so-and-so. I'm like, it doesn't matter what they did, that was 30 years ago. That's because the world is so different. Um, and there's never been a better time for young, particularly women, and people of color to rise into the sea level. So let's not go look at what old white men did to get there. Let's design our own pathways for ourselves to be at the sea level. Um, and then the last thing is have some very good technical skills. So it's not enough to just you know work your way up that's not enough at the sea level. You need to be able to run a business. You need to understand the technical operations of p ls of companies, of boards. And so take the craft very seriously and really study and understand the technical parts of, of the potential role that you seek. And how do you think that's different for anybody who's interested in pursuing an entrepreneurial endeavor and starting their own business? Would your advice look any different or how would it change? My advice for entrepreneurs who are becoming CEOs for the first time and, uh, and COOs and CFOs, definitely is different. Um, I would say for a founder, making that transition from founder to CEO is a very specific moment in time. And oftentimes founders are very reluctant, present company included, to step into the CEO position. Uh, you call yourself a CEO, of course, you know, you're like CEO of one, <laughs> right? But CEO of 100 employees, CEO of 5,000 employees, 500 employees, it's a completely different operation and a different skill set. Um, I remember when I had my first board meeting for the first time, and I was, I was the chairwoman of the board, the board was me. And after I raised my first round of funding, you know, you have other people on the board. My lawyer started going to the board meeting. We had a board of, a observer and a board member and I added one of my co-founders to the board. Okay, well now I need to be an executive chairwoman. What does that mean? How do I do that? So making those transitions from founder to CEO um, or founder to COO or whatever that position, C-level position is, is actually an incredible leap. Um, and I don't think that people talk about what it requires and how you have to change and grow and learn uh, very quickly if you want your company and your startup to be able to continue to scale. Yeah, that's right. And I think that you, you're you so honest about that and you use your platform, I think, to talk a lot about that. And you also have an amazing project that's focused on mindset and productivity titled The Growth Notebook. Can you share where this idea was born and why this mindset and productivity are integral to success? Yeah, so I started The Growth Notebooks um, for a few different reasons. I am a meticulous like list maker um, and I set my goals quarterly, I set my goals monthly and annually um, and I had a whole system with stickies and all this organization and I remember I was working with um, one of our early employees, Marissa, we were talking about productivity and we just had a lot of balls that you're juggling because you know early days you're the marketing manager, the ad ops manager, you're everything. And we were talking about it and she was like, you're just so, you do so much. And I was like, girl, I have a whole system that I have built, you know, to, in my mind for the last four or five years. <laughs> and um, I started to just share how I organize my calendar, how I organize my emails. And I realized that that's not always something that we talk about in our communities. It's actually the efficient ways to scale smartly with your time um, so that you're not... Uh, doing everything manually. And so I wanted to create a system and share my system for how I operate. So the productivity notebook is all about 
celebrating your wins, how much water are you drinking, your fitness routines, and sticking with your goals, your annual goals, both personal and business. And then the gratitude notebook is that nightly notebook that I use every night. It's the three things I'm grateful for, my wins of the day, and my goals for tomorrow. You've also extended a 20, 25% discount to Just Fab VIPs on their purchase of a growth notebook. Thank you so much. I actually can't incorporate, wait to incorporate it into my own routine as well. I'm always looking for good productivity hacks and, uh, and definitely love having a space specifically for my journaling and for gratitude. So let's dive into talking about fashion, which is something that we both share a love for. How do you define your personal style and how has it evolved with your career and you know your leadership? Yeah. My fashion style today, I would call it like business casual glam, but I'm very minimalistic as well. So like I don't wear that much makeup. I, you know, super simple jewelry, a lot of classics. Um, but I was that founder who literally wore a hoodie and like jeans every day. You would not see me. You would see me in San Francisco with Blavity t-shirts. I mean, people could yell like, hey, Blavity, and I would turn around like way back in the day. So <laughs> it wasn't until I had to become a little bit more of a public persona, you know, a CEO, um, and transitioned a little bit out of the founder day to day that I started to evolve my personal style. Um, it's a really freeing experience to ask yourself, who am I and what do I want to represent through my style and how I look? And because I'm the boss, I also have the privilege of setting the tone. And so I took that very seriously, just in terms of our office style, our office culture, um, and also my own personal efficiency. So making sure that I didn't set up a personal style or look that required me to spend 30, 40 minutes getting dressed every day. I was like, I would rather be doing something else with that time. So that's how I um, came up with my style. So during the day, you know, it's like button downs, Oxfords um, with leggings, cute shoes, super comfortable, um, and light, light, light makeup, you know, it, oftentimes curly hair, bun, you know, and then at uh, when I'm doing speaking engagements or traveling, um, bright colors, really making sure that I stand out and that I feel confident in the clothes that I wear. Um, so yeah, I, tr I, I go between those two. Your curated Just Fab Shoe collection is titled The Limitless Collection, reflecting your belief that the only thing holding us back is our own false perceptions of our limits. The things we tell ourselves that we can never do. How do you feel that one's fashion choices can break those boundaries or push limits as women? And you know, how do you think about the empowering forces behind that? Um, the Limitless Collection, I'm so excited for you all to dabble in it and start to buy these things because it is so important that you feel and you look great. So before a meeting, even when I'm working from home, I will get fully dressed if I have a big interview or if I have a big meeting and from head to toe because I want to show up and feel confident and I don't want to um, I don't want to have those little voices saying oh you know you really should have put on makeup you should have put on this outfit uh, and so I bring my best my a-game every single time and so this collection has some cozy it has some cozy vibes to it with a little glam you know, um, but then also we've got, I've got heels and boots and things that we're going to really make sure that you feel ready to go for whatever's coming your way. We always end our Leading with Style interviews with the same question. What is the best advice a woman you admire has given to you? So the best advice that a woman I admire, one of my mentors gave me was that I need to listen more. Um, I was going to her with all these problems, all these complaints, and um, she, her advice was like, you know, you need to listen more. You need to listen to the people around you. You need to listen to your business partners, to your employees, and the answers that you seek are right in front of you. Maybe you don't want to hear them. Maybe your ego is in the way. Um, but if you learn how to listen more effectively, you're gonna have a much better time and easier time navigating the challenges that I was trying to overcome. That's a good mentor and some tough love. Tough I used love. to hear <laughs> one of my favorites is still, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, so you should be using them <laughs> with Ooh, that ratio in that's mind. That's a good one. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for your time, Morgan. I am so thrilled that we're partnering with you and that the world gets to see your collection. I cannot wait for women to experience the Limitless collection. And um, and I really hope that this conversation, you know, allows us all to move into further into 2021, feeling inspired and empowered. And I thank you for your part in doing that. And thank you all for joining us. We'll be back in April with our next woman who is leading with style. Thank you so much. It's so fun.